Uh, Mark 15, um, 40 through 47. I'll read that out for us and we'll get started. There were also women looking on from a distance, that is at Jesus' crucifixion, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is God's word to us tonight. Well, Benjamin Franklin said in 1789 that our new constitution is now established and has has the appearance uh, that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. True enough. Everyone wants lower taxes and to avoid death at all costs. So I think it's fair to say that we're always on the lookout for tax breaks. And in some ways, we are in a state of death avoidance. Some cases, death denial. Uh, We know that it's certain, but we find ourselves certainly not wanting to deal with it. Uh, We're not familiar with it. And we don't want to be familiar with it. It makes us uncomfortable. Uh, We do all that we can to avoid it. Uh, In some cases, we medicate to prolong its coming. We use products and surgery to prolong its appearing. Uh, It makes us, in some cases, avoid others who are in fact grieving. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that. You've been grieving yourself and just have found people Uh, not knowing how to respond to you, to your circumstance, perhaps experiencing death yourself. Uh, Out of ignorance, people say things that are just unhelpful and in some cases hurtful. Uh, We don't even like to use the word death, and so we say phrases like they've passed away or have gone to a better place, or as they say in some hospitals, there has been a negative patient outcome. But then we experience events like yesterday, even in the middle of the night, where death has been on the news, forced into our viewing uh, in a gruesome, violent, evil way. It reminds us that death is all around us, and it's a constant reminder of our finitude or our finiteness. We are finite in our mortality, in our knowledge, in our abilities and in our experience, we're we're limited. And from a scientific perspective, we don't really know much about death. Uh, We don't have the ability to stop it, certainly, and yet until you go through it, you can't experience it. Uh, It's like what Woody Allen said, uh, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. That's the way we approach it. And if we're being honest with ourselves, this tension is real, even for the Christ follower, for the Christian. Uh, And when we deny the reality of death, ultimately we're denying the reality of and the consequences of sin. Genesis 1 and 2 show us this world that God created, beautiful and full of life, absent of the sting of death. Death was not a part of the original plan. It was... It was not until sin, that is rebellion against the creator God, entered the picture. It wasn't until then that death became an imminent threat to life. And when Adam and Eve disbelieved God's word to them, when he said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die, 
when they disbelieved that and instead believed the word of the serpent who said, you will not surely die, they took delight, not in God himself, but in the idea that they could be like God. They rebelled. They committed treason against their holy God creator. And then God in his justice said, for out of the ground you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And we've lived our lives under the curse of being not like God ever since. So the bad news is that try as we might, we can't save ourselves from death. And we can't become like God, infinite and immortal. Pulitzer Prize winner Ernest Becker, who was uh, not a Christian, but a Jewish cultural anthropologist of the early, early uh, 20th century said, the irony of man's condition, and this is observing just from a, uh, a non-Christian perspective, the irony of man's condition is that the deepest need is to be free from the anxiety of death and annihilation. But it is life itself which awakens that fear. And so we must shrink back from being fully alive. Now, Becker's solution to escape death and experience life to the full was to deny the terror of death. It was a psychological answer to a fundamentally spiritual problem. But the gospel, the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ is that while we cannot become like God in order to save ourselves from death, God, in his love and mercy, became like us, to save us. And where we're at in Mark's account of his gospel story, Mark's account of God becoming like us, is at the pinnacle moment of God's experience as a human. Jesus had been born a baby. He had grown in stature and wisdom. He had lived, he had laughed, he had grieved, he had cried. And now at the hands of Roman soldiers, he was crucified. And he was dead. So what does that mean? What does it mean that God became a man, lived, and died? What does it mean that our greatest fear, our greatest enemy, death, was experienced by God himself? What does it mean that he was buried and he himself was placed in a tomb, returned to the dust? Well, that's what we're going to look at here in Mark 15, 40 through 47. Because what Mark is doing here is proving that Jesus was in fact dead. He really died. And Mark proves proves this by showing us this through the events of Jesus' burial from the perspective of several unlikely witnesses. A group of women, Joseph, a Jewish Pharisee, and a Roman centurion. And while these events... And certainly the witnesses seem unlikely. We need to ask ourselves, why? Why mention this? What is significant for you and for me about the burial of Jesus? So we want to see those unlikely witnesses and have those witnesses point us to the necessity of the outcome. And so we'll look at unlikely witnesses and a necessary outcome. So first... Let's look at these unlikely witnesses to Jesus' burial. Our passage begins just as Jesus has died, and the Roman centurion has confessed Jesus as the Son of God. Truly, this man was the Son of God. After witnessing the crucifixion, the events surrounding that, the, the, the earthquake, the darkness, this was his confession. And Mark describes that from a distance, there were a group, a small group of women looking on. And these women were part of Jesus' disciples, his followers. They had traveled with him and had uh, witnessed him perform miracle after miracle. They had heard his teaching. In fact, they had provided uh, a ministry to Jesus himself. And now they were witnesses to his crucifixion, to his death, to the death of their Messiah, their Savior. The women mentioned here are Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James the Younger and Joseph, and also Salome. And you might remember Mary Magdalene from Luke chapter 8. She is the one who was delivered from demonic possession. 
And it's a little less clear as to who this Mary is being referred to, um, the mother of Joseph and James the Younger. It's, it's possible that this could be referenced to Jesus' own mother. We know that at some point she was present. Uh, but it's most likely a, a different Mary. And then finally, you have Salome. Uh, and if you're familiar with any biblical genealogy, you might remember that two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, are brothers. They're the sons of Zebedee. This is Salome, Zebedee's wife, the mother of James and John. Now, why would Mark mention these women? And even more so, just mention them by name. There were likely other witnesses there. But we must keep in mind the importance and the goal of the gospel writers. And in this case, Mark, he wants to provide a, a detailed account and proof of true events. Uh, the death and burial and then the forthcoming resurrection of Jesus was not meant to turn into myth or legend. No, this is reporting. This is actual truth, true accounts of true events. Uh, you, you have read in other gospel accounts that even some of the Jewish leaders were, cons were concerned about the formation of a conspiracy, which is why Roman soldiers eventually stood guard in front of the sealed tomb. They wanted to prevent grave robbers. So the names of eyewitnesses to the events in Jesus' life and death throughout the gospel, but particularly here, um, throughout of these gospels, they are to provide proof of witness. And the personal names, though very much uh, common in other gospel accounts, not so common in the gospel of Mark, the appearance at this point, at this point in Mark's telling of Jesus' death is to provide his readers, which was most likely the church in Rome, with a forensic eyewitness account of these events. Now, the next person mentioned is Joseph of Arimathea. And he plays a more active role in this part of the narrative. Uh, and so as the women looked on from a distance, Joseph, a respected member of the council, that is the, the council of the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, um, he was himself looking for the kingdom of God. He took courage and he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, beyond these accounts, we don't know much about Joseph other than what was mentioned here. Uh, the other gospels describe him as a member of the council of the Pharisees, uh, but he himself did not consent to putting Jesus to death. He's described as a good and righteous man. Uh, Matthew even describes him as a disciple of Jesus, which echoes Mark's description that he was looking for the kingdom of God. But he's also described as, as someone who kind of kept it a secret. He didn't want all his buddies to know that he was looking for this kingdom of God or particularly following Jesus. But here in this scene of devotion to Jesus, even in death, Joseph summons up the courage to go before Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus, a condemned criminal, in order to give him a proper Jewish burial. Now, this wouldn't have been completely unusual, but it's also not very common. You see, most victims of crucifixion, as Jesus was, they weren't buried. Uh, they were left on the cross until they began to decay. This was part of the terror of crucifixion. Uh, sometimes their bodies were taken down, but just left to nature, to animals and such. Uh, after the crucifixion, but their bodies weren't typically buried. But on occasion, these bodies were given over to relatives or friends in order to receive a proper burial. And this would have been especially true for Jews, in particular for a Pharisee like Joseph, a strict follower of the law. Uh, in Deuteronomy 21, uh, the Jewish nation is instructed that if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him in the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. Now, since Joseph was a sympathetic man towards Jesus, at minimum, he was likely a follower, even in secret, uh, we're told that he wanted to get the body of Jesus before sundown, and this is probably why. Uh, but this is also why Mark mentions the timing. It's Friday afternoon. It's nearing evening. The sun is going down. This is the day of preparation for the coming Saturday Sabbath. So Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, it would have been important for Joseph, 
to get Jesus, his body, sealed in the tomb before the Sabbath period began. So this is Joseph's duty to the Jewish law and perhaps fueled his urgency and fueled his courage to go before Pilate. We need to get Jesus' body sealed in the tomb so he can lie at rest on the Sabbath and then we could come back on Sunday to anoint him, to embalm him, or so to speak. So to obtain the rights to Jesus' body, Joseph went before Pilate, who was, as we've read, stunned to find out that Jesus was already dead. The death on, death on a cross could take hours and hours and hours, sometimes days. Uh, that's why it was so agonizing and so horrific for the victim. And so Pilate was skeptical. And due to Pilate's skepticism, Jesus' death was confirmed by another unlikely witness, the centurion in verse 45. Now, it's been speculated that this is the same centurion who, was confessed, who had confessed Jesus as the Son of God back in verse 39 that we heard about last week. And based on the way that Mark writes, this could be true. Uh, even though there's no way of knowing for sure, we know that this, this centurion was witness to Jesus' death and confirms it to Pilate that Jesus has indeed died. And so we have mention here of five eyewitnesses to Jesus' death. Now, why am I labeling these eyewitnesses as unlikely? Well, we look at who we're talking about. A group of women, a Jewish leader, and a Roman centurion. The centurion worked for Pilate and the Roman Empire. In, also in that culture, the testimony of women would have been severely discounted. And Joseph, as influential and powerful as he might have been, he was part of the group that just had Jesus executed. And so I think two things are happening here that highlight their significance. First, from a forensic perspective, as I mentioned the witnesses, Mark isn't bringing forward a group of, of witnesses from some narrow group, obviously uh, like-minded and possible conspirators. We know from Matthew's gospel that the Jewish leaders were afraid of Jesus' body being stolen after it was put in the tomb. So Mark gives this assortment of eyewitnesses. And it's, it's also very stark here that Jesus' own uh, disciples, they're nowhere to be found. So there's a wide variety of witnesses to Jesus' death. Women, men, powerful, timid, courageous, and fearful. They all saw Jesus breathe his last. He was, in fact, dead. And in verse 47, they saw that he was sealed in Joseph's tomb. So it's significant from a forensic perspective for historical accuracy. But the second point of significance is that they, these are precisely the people that Jesus came to die for and to save. You see, he didn't come for the most outwardly deserving people. However you and I or even people in this culture would have defined deserving or most likely however we measure such things. He called out and invested three years of his life into his closest disciples. Yes, that's true. But Jesus came for Jew and Gentile, Gentile, that is anyone who is not Jewish, like the Roman centurion. Men and women, poor and rich, powerful and weak, these are witnesses to the reality and power of Jesus' death. They're from all nations from all tongues, from all walks of life. And that is still true today. And if you're a Christian, you too are a witness to the power of Jesus' death and the effect faith in Jesus has had on your life. And if we were to take a poll of everyone's story in here, it is true that we would come from all of these different backgrounds. And just like this group of people, we could be labeled as unlikely would you, like Joseph of Arimathea tonight, take courage to confess to skeptics like Pilate that Jesus has in fact died? But not merely for forensic proof, not to just win an argument or prove a point, but for the purpose of spiritual transformation. Because while Joseph laid Jesus in his tomb, cut out of the rock, sealed with the stone, we know that this is not Jesus' final resting place. Perhaps you identify with Joseph who acts compassionately and honorably, but had been following Jesus from a distance out of fear and secrecy. Or maybe you feel ostracized, distant, 
afraid, marginalized, like this group of women would have felt in their culture. Like your words, your testimony, they just won't be believed. They won't make a difference. Maybe that's who you identify with in this story. You see yourself as an unlikely witness. Would you be emboldened tonight to be a proclaimer and a witness to the change and impact that Jesus has had in your life to those who need to hear the message of the gospel? Because in truth, like I said, we're all unlikely witnesses. We are all, like Adam and Eve, rebels, undeserving of God's grace and mercy. God was under no obligation to save us according to his justice, to become like us in the flesh. But in love, knowing that we cannot become like him, he indeed became like us and paid the debt that we could not pay, that we've already sung about tonight. Jesus died in order to save us. And this leads us a group of unlikely witnesses to look at the necessity of the outcome, the necessary outcome of Jesus' life in order to, uh, to accomplish his rescue mission was, in fact, his death. So we've looked at unlikely witnesses. Now let's look at the necessary outcome. At the beginning, I asked, why mention this? What's significant what is significant about Jesus' burial for you and for me? Is it merely for Mark's readers to corroborate this group of, of witnesses to refute a claim of conspiracy? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul reminds his readers of the gospel message. The good news, he says, in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Paul goes on to say, For I have I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve. No, the burial of Jesus is not merely forensic, or apologetically significant. The death and burial of Jesus emphasizes two important gospel realities that we stand on and by which we are being saved. The first of those gospel truths is that sin is deadly. Jesus' burial emphasizes and proves to us that sin is deadly. Romans 6.23 reminds us that the wages of sin is death. Because of our sin, we have earned death. Your sin and my sin carry with it a death sentence. And I fear that we are sometimes tempted to live like we don't really believe that truth with respect to our sin. Oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a little sin. I'll move past it. I'll get over it. They'll get over it. We forget or we just flat out deny that God's justice requires payment for our sin. And if we're left on our own to pay for the penalty of our sin, for our sin, we would have to suffer an eternal separation from our holy God. You see, God's holiness and our sin are like, like ends of the largest cosmic magnet you can think of. If you've ever put, did that experiment as a kid, you take two like ends of a magnet, say the two north ends of a magnet, put it together and let go, and what happens? The mag magnets shoot apart from each other. They can't be together by natural law. They just can't. By spiritual law, by holiness, God is opposed to sin. In his holiness cannot be a part of sin. And so they are opposed to each other. But more than that, our sin is rebellion against God. It's our attempt, as I said at the beginning, to dethrone him from our lives and live as though he doesn't exist. It's treason on a cosmic and eternal scale. So either we suffer eternally for the consequences of our sin, us trying to be God, or God in his mercy becomes one of us to die and pay the penalty for our sin on our behalf. Because yes, sin is deadly. That's the first truth that Jesus' burial highlights for us. The second is that sin is defeated. Sin is deadly, 
But Jesus' burial proves to us that sin is defeated. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The penalty has been paid by Jesus, and we should have no remaining fear of condemnation or punishment because Jesus died, because there was no more blood pumping through his veins, because there was no more air circulating through his lungs, because he took the full wrath of God and said, it is finished, and he was sealed in a tomb because the debt was paid in full. If Jesus didn't die, there's no payment for sin. Why is the burial of Jesus so important? Because Jesus died. And so there is no mistaking that the demand of sin has been met. Jesus' body laid in the tomb so the corpse of your sin can be left in the tomb. What has been undone and what was broken by Adam in the Garden of Eden has now been paid for and redeemed by Jesus. And now that he lays in the garden tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' body lie at Sabbath rest. Jesus died on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. He was buried by sundown by Joseph, but Jesus' work was finished. He was at rest. The payment was made. Sin was defeated. The work is finished, and Sunday is in fact coming. New life was on its way. So sin is deadly, but Jesus was buried, and sin is defeated. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your sin, on the one hand, carries with it a death sentence? If it doesn't, Jesus died for nothing. And you and I were, were, were tempted sometimes to make little of our sin. Let Jesus' burial be proof to you that sin is eternally a big deal. Friends, don't underestimate your sin. It is deadly. But perhaps you're also tempted, on the other hand, to believe that your sins haven't been paid in full. Are you tempted to believe that Jesus' death didn't quite cover all of it? That you still owe a little something? That can be a burden that you can't bear. It's a penalty that you can't pay. Friends, don't underestimate your sin, but yes, don't underestimate Jesus' death and the meaning of his burial. When Jesus was resurrected, sin didn't get out of the tomb with him. It remained because Jesus died and paid the price for our sin, and sin is defeated. And so we need to walk in light of this. We need to live in light of the defeat of sin and the burial of Jesus. Now next week, we will look at the resurrection because the story is not complete until Jesus gets out of the tomb. But tonight, we've had a chance to look at the reality of what Jesus' death and the finality of burial means in the life of, yes, the, the greater gospel story, but also in your life and what it means for the consequences of sin for each of us. And so we'll conclude now and pray and give God thanks for these things and we'll, pr we'll respond by singing. Father, we are grateful tonight for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. We're grateful that he took the full wrath of you, of your sin, of our, against our sin, the wrath of God on himself, in his body. And we're grateful that he died in our place. Lord, we're grateful for what the tomb represents. It's the final resting place for the consequences of our sin. And that Jesus really did die. And our sins really are paid for. Would you help us to, on the one hand, see the consequences of our sin and the, the deadliness of our sin. That we would take our sin and our fight against sin seriously. But that we would also walk in the truth that our sin, the penalty for our sin has been paid and it's been defeated that we stand in right relationship with you. Our sin has been atoned for. The penalty has been paid. Hallelujah. Lord, would you help us to respond by living 
the life that you've called us to live because of this truth. Help us to respond now in worship. In Jesus' name, amen.